Hi, I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and welcome to Mirror of Intimacy, uh, my conversations, which are eclectic conversations with all sorts of interesting people. And today you're going to hear Dr. Terry Marks Tarlow talk to me about play, creativity, and the myth of talent. And I've known Terry for about 10 years now and have had the good fortune of watching her amazingly interesting. Um, sort of divergent creative mind um, run the gamut from being an expert in nonlinear dynamic theory to writing a libretto for an opera for the Juilliard School um, to making a coloring book. So you're in for a real treat um, as you hear her talk today about the ways that you can bring these sort of big ideas of creativity into your daily life. Um, and I was thinking when I called you and invited you to have this conversation about sort of everyday creativity or everyday intuition because I think people don't think about that very much. I think when people think about creativity, they think, I'm not that creative. I don't write or draw or play the violin. So I wonder if you could talk about sort of how creativity plays into our everyday lives. I think everybody should be thinking about creativity. I, I think that everybody has the capacity to be creative in different ways and now more than ever in our culture we need it mm -hmm. you know I, I when when people had this job that their parents had and when culture was kind of static and not changing maybe it wasn't as necessary but with so much going on, with so much information, too much information, mm -hmm. and so much change that we have to metabolize, it's almost a way of getting on top of all that change and, and coming from the inside out instead of being bombarded from the outside in. Wow, that's a really interesting thought that you said. Yeah, there was a time when people were handed down the family business. Is mm -hmm. that what you're saying? Yeah. And I guess there was a creativity in that because somebody germinated that thing. Somebody had an idea mm -hmm. and then each generation kind of grew it with their own stamp on it. Mm -hmm. And you're saying now we don't have that as much. Yeah. And if, if we even go back further where culture was cyclic instead of linear mm -hmm. and history didn't even exist. Oh, and right. So, you know, the cycles of nature <clears throat> and the cycles of days and seasons and the sun and the moon mm -hmm. and, and all of that would just go round and round and round. And now we the, the amount of change is really incredible. I mean, if you think to when we were, well, I think I'm older than you, but a little bit. when we were kids, what was going on technologically and oh, what's yeah. going on now. Yeah, we had TV and radio. <laughs> yeah, there were no computers. When I did yeah. my dissertation, actually, that was the very beginning of computers. Mm -hmm. And so the amount of change is just extraordinary. Right. And, and so creativity, our, our own creativity, it's almost like an antidote to, uh -huh. to change. And it's, it's like seizing the moment. And it can be anywhere. You know, I, one of the ways I um, express myself, and, and really novelty and creativity go hand in hand, mm -hmm. so just making novel choices. So I try to drive to and from work different routes oh, every day. Right. Every day. And how do you think that informs you or inspires you by doing that? It just keeps me fresh. Okay. So that's like an everyday thing that people can do. That's one everyday thing. Cooking is a really yeah. good example. Yeah, I've always yeah. thought of cooking being incredibly creative. And it doesn't mean you have to be a master chef or you know, be making fancy things, just the idea of sort of choosing what the season brings to you in your market mm -hmm. and using that, all the colors and variety that come from that. Mm -hmm. All the senses. Oh, right. You can feel creative. All the senses. Mm -hmm. That's that's definitely having having a, a great conversation that's unpredictable. That's oh, creative. The I art see. of conversation, the right. art of humor. Mm -hmm. All of that are these little tiny micro ways of Dipping in to, dipping in. There, there's a um, professor at Harvard, Ellen Langer, who is, I think, very interesting. She did mindfulness before Cabot Zinn, and her definition is the perception of novelty. So wait, creativity is the perception of novelty? Well, her definition of mindfulness oh, oh, okay. is the perception of, of novelty, oh. rather than simply the perception of what is. 
So oh. it's a more active mm -hmm. seeking right. of what's new sure. in perception. And really, the idea that of things staying the same is an illusion. Right. 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 I mean, nothing stays, stays the same. Yeah. Oh, that's really beautiful. So this notion that maybe if I do walk to work in this on the same street every day, that I'm if I'm seeking novelty, there's something um, fresh and new and excitatory about that, mm -hmm. as opposed to being dull and and taking for granted that I've already seen that. Right, or even worse, being so locked into your own worries and thoughts and inner world oh, right. that you're yeah. not even paying attention. Yeah. So for me, for example, I live in Topanga. I work in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. I come down the PCH every day, and the color of the ocean mm -hmm. is different. Yeah. And just the quality of it, right. the smoothness or the roughness, the waves, the, whether they're cars, whether they're surfers, whether uh -huh. they're people walking or bicyclists, uh, when the sun comes up, when it goes down, all of that is something I can pay attention to, yeah. even as I'm stuck in traffic sure. for two hours. That's or, beautiful. You know. Right, which also brings you right into the present moment mm -hmm. um, and allows you to have a different experience of and that. And not get frustrated. Yeah, of that dynamism, yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, as you were talking, I thought, huh, this is also sort of a key for successful relationships over time. Absolutely. That if we see our partners in this static way or dulled out way, we're not really seeking their unique novelty or how they're changing all the time. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, and and probably the worst when when couples come in for work, mm -hmm. when one couple says, "I know exactly what he's going to say," oh, right, yeah, it's a problem. It is a problem, right? <laughs> right. Because then people are being defensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's a completely fear-based, defensive stance to think we know what our partner is going to do, and if we do, then there's no real contact. And that's a closed system. It's not exactly. open. It's not curious. Exactly. Right? Like, gee, I wonder what you're going to say to that, as opposed to I already know what you're going to say. Exactly. Exactly. And in some ways, as, as therapists, when, when we seek meaning, we're seeking novel ways of, of looking at old experience. And oh, right. That's a form of creativity. I see. Yeah. Sure. So... I think everybody can, um, no matter no, no matter what they do or don't do, homemakers mm -hmm. can can find these pockets of everyday existence mm -hmm. where something new can be found and emerge. Right. Mm -hmm. So when did you get first get interested in this notion of both creativity and intuition and the interplay? That's a good question. Um, when I was a little girl, mm -hmm. also, my mom thought I should, I, I guess I had some fairly good drawing skills, although in my opinion not compared to some of the other elementary school kids who right. seemed to be more naturally able to draw, but she thought I should be either an architect and do uh, drawing, that kind of technical mm -hmm. drawing, or um, medical drawing. Oh, wow. And because, and, and um, I sort of had an eye to do very technical kinds of drawing. And um, so I played with the idea of being an artist. And in uh, college, I went to Rhode mm -hmm. Island School of Design for a summer mm -hmm. to, play, to play with that idea. Right. And the choice was either try to be one of these kinds of artists or be a, be a psych, or, well, go into psychology oh, at see. that point. And I, I enjoyed the summer, but I came away thinking it's too lonely, I couldn't make any money, mm. and I'm not talented enough. And, uh -huh. that, and that idea of talent, not being talented enough, has haunted me for oh, yeah. all the way from the beginning. And I think it, it inhibits a lot of people from even trying to be creative, but really being creative has nothing to do with talent at all. Mm. And in fact, the more, it's just... It's just experience. It's just playing with it. And trying. It's more like play. Yeah, yeah. trying. It's interesting because your art is so provocative, and you've well, illustrated. You. I mean, you illustrated my new workbook, Sexual Reflections. You have your own coloring book. Um, you've illustrated your own books. 
This um, is true. And you have all these, your own artwork that you've made for just art's sake. So This is true. I think of you as wildly talented well, and creative. Well, I tricked myself. <laughs> I tricked myself to start that because the first the first thing that I really illustrated was uh, the Psyche's Veil vale book, which I did not bring. Right. Um, but and I did it because <clears throat> images didn't exist for the concepts oh, I was trying I to write about. Yeah. And as soon as I switched over from thinking about art as communication, uh -huh. from art as a display of talent. Oh. Then I got more comfortable. Wow. So I almost I, I tricked myself by thinking about it more technically, mm -hmm. um, and and um, practically in a way. Well, it's so true because imagery speaks to us in a particular way where yes. sometimes there are just no words for That's something. That's right. And imagery is deeper than words. It's older than words. Mm -hmm. It's preverbal. It touches us more and um, it it's able to say more too because it's a spatial it has that whole spatial component to it right. whereas words are just linear it's just uh, got yeah. a string of one word after another and that's it right so it, they're they're the potential to communicate through pictures is is really great and, and and the pictures allow us to fill in the blanks in our own unique that's way true. i mean that's one of the powerful thing about the images that you created for my workbook is um it's so interesting for me now to hear what people have to say about these images they're so sure about what they are uh, they're like uh, projective exactly, devices exactly so. yes and i'm thinking no that's actually not what that image was according to the artist but um, i love hearing how people um, fill that in and so when I think about creativity whether it's in your own garden um, or what you're choosing to wear or whatever you, it sounds like we're all kind of filling in those spaces so which is a great point because from a relational point of view it's really co-creativity isn't it oh, nice. where the yeah. viewer or the reader is using imagination yeah to truly flesh out the piece of work and that's true, like you said, in relationship, that as we're in a conversation, mm -hmm. right, we're trying to find each other mm -hmm. and find out what the meaning is and how we feel towards each other and mm -hmm. fill it in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying that this has been a lifelong um, emergent process for yeah, you. Yeah, almost circling back around mm. at various points, circling back around to something that I was interested in but um, not either not brave enough to dive in mm -hmm. like for example the the first book that I did um, was in education called creativity inside out mm -hmm. except it was about creativity instead of expressing my oh, own creativity right because I wasn't ready play turns out to be even deeper than creativity and play and intuition certainly go hand in hand so how so? How is play deeper than creativity? Because you talk about adult play also. Mm -hmm. um, so this and sex play is certainly sex play for certain, <laughs> very important um, for But this book is great for psychotherapists, um, play and creativity and psychotherapy. So um, I have a copy of this book. It's a beautiful book. So oh, I would recommend so that to thank any you. psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And um, also you've talked about how play is so important to learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've talked about adult play. So mm -hmm. um, I think adult play is incredibly important, both in the sexual realm, but certainly out of it because of in where life. our conversation started mm -hmm. about how flattened everything's gotten and um, right. digitized. Right. So play is really deep because it's one of uh, Yak Pinksep's mm. seven motivational emotional circuits that are shared by all mammals and so essentially the play circuit and flex a flexible brain and flexible mind mm -hmm. go hand in hand mm. and so having as opposed to say reptiles that just have a few motor cycles that they repeat mm. over and over again we have this incredibly flexible capability of even having novelty mm -hmm. in our behavioral repertoire. And so play goes hand in hand with an open, having an open brain that allows for that sort of thing. So it's really a precursor to art mm -hmm. and it's critical in development. Right. It's really from, um, in, in development, 
play, relational play between mother and child, father and child, especially father and child, mm -hmm. often yeah. in the second year of life, um, is what boosts up positive emotions. It also boosts up intrinsic motivation. So if it's this is a tragedy, I think, in our culture yeah. of how overstructured childhood is mm -hmm. because um, it, it, it really um, prevents children from finding their own interests, passions, curiosity, all of that, all of that stuff that comes from the inside and, and lasts a lifetime mm -hmm. or allows us to endure if a task is really hard. The more we're playing at what we're doing, right. you know, then the more um, passionate we can um, we can be a, about it. So. Right, and I think there's problem solving in that. You're right. Sure. But, I mean, I grew up in Florida. I grew up on the river. Um, we always had boats of any cool. all sorts of That's cool. things. So everything from, you know, it would rain and flood and we would collect tadpoles and turn them into frogs or there would be some task of trying to get like making things out of sticks and mm -hmm. wood and mm -hmm. or trying to fix something mm -hmm. and there would be frustration but high level of focus and interest in making it happen so we could finish playing mm -hmm. so the world the natural world was where we played and, and look, look at all the skills you picked <laughs> right. up while but, you were playing just as a part of the Play. Right, and part of learning, uh, you know, the frustration and then the victory of making something float, mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe my brother bombing it or collapsing it and <laughs> upset about that. <laughs> um, but, uh -huh. so, well, and then also the thing about uh, free play and unstructured yeah. play that's so, so important is that um, you make up the rules and oh. you internalize the rules, mm -hmm. which is how society works. And so you're internalizing the rules of society and and uh, doing it from the inside as opposed to somebody structuring something and telling you the rules or telling you where to go. Oh, right, which is much more rigid and dictatorial. Rigid and creates uh, children who don't mature as, as uh, early as yeah. we did because oh, wow. we were so free mm -hmm. And we had to depend on ourselves yeah. to be safe mm -hmm. and to and to interact and to create those rules of interaction. Right. To try things. To try new things. Right. I mean, I think that's why we see this whole failure to launch crowd. Exactly. Um, it's a big today, part of it. it's just shocking to me um, when I see kids. You know, they're going away to college and they flame out not because they're not intelligent, but because they cannot function. Right. They can't get to their internships on time. Um, they don't know how to, you know, interact exactly. with adults. They they haven't been responsible for themselves, and I like to think of responsibility as literally the ability to respond. No, oh, which nice. is what we're talking about. Yeah, and that starts from really early on, the right from the beginning. To play. Right. So and so, play is um, being one of those circuits that is is wired in, hardwired right. in from from birth, and then gets. Uh, Tweaked, tweaked, and etc. Through experience, um, like intuition. Yeah. You know where that's an inside-out sort of feeling. Right, and people say, "Well, I don't have my intuition's not that great," but everybody's hardwired for intuition, just Everybody as they are with is. play. Right. What about adult play? And sure, and that's how right. That, we wanted to right, talk about how that. How does that manifest, and where does that go? Well, just like I, I wanted to say that creativity is something that can be moment to moment in the search for novelty, mm -hmm. I think play also can be moment to moment. And so I kind of like to think of myself as playing all the time. Mm. Like I think you and I are playing. Right you know, now. We're, yeah, we're yeah. playing with ideas. We're playing with words. We're playing with one another. Uh -huh. um, I... I hold what I do as a therapist rather lightly, and I I play, which I don't mean that I don't take it seriously. Of I course. do, and people talk about horrendous and very serious trauma, but in in finding sort of the way in that's going to make a difference. I think of that as play. Mm -hmm. I sort mm -hmm. of, I, try, I go here, it's like an exploratory mm -hmm. adventure. Yeah, so right. exploration is a form of play. 
Um, so trying this and trying that and, and all of that and and not um, not being too hard on myself if something doesn't work. Right. I play in yoga. Uh -huh. um, people that are serious and they have scowls and they fall down and they're angry at themselves or they're angry at their teacher for <laughs> right. having them do something they can't do. Whereas if, if one approaches yoga or any other mm. kind of pursuit with a playful attitude, mm -hmm. even if it's not formal play, right. then um, our egos are more flexible, we're more uh, resilient. Yeah. So that goes back to just being open to possibility. Being open. And just being open. seeing what happens. That's right. That's and, central. Yeah. And that ties back to this notion, I'm still, this is really resounding for me, this notion of talent or lack of talent, right. Screw and that. that is really, yeah, it's really reductive and it closes everything That's right. down, yes. as opposed to, I don't know whether I can or can't draw, but I'm going to try, uh -huh. and I'm going to see what happens in the trying, and as I keep doing it, what continues to emerge and show up. Right, and as you keep doing it, you will definitely get better, because it's we, we improve complex skills implicitly not explicitly mm. so we don't the, the the idea that you have to start out with talent is the essence of a fixed mindset yeah and a fixed mindset is the opposite of a growth mindset we all need a growth mindset and I think we all grow through play and right I love that because it means we can continue to be generative as we age because oftentimes um, a, the notion of aging is that we become more closed, more fixed, more rigid. And I love the idea of the possibility of becoming more open-minded as I get older. I have to say, apparently the Hammer Museum uh -huh. right now has a 97-year-old artist wow. who looks amazing. Uh -huh. And um, she clearly is as generative, if not more, now than, oh, right. than before. For, but but of course you don't have to be an artist to stay generous. Sure, yeah. It's I think the quality of open openness and an open mind is is the most important thing, and and the more we the more we age, the more stuff moves from the right brain to the left. So that we get we get good automatically at it through mm -hmm. habit. But that frees our minds up as well. Mm. So if we if we fill our minds with new stuff, All right and new frontiers, then absolutely we can stay generative. Yeah, and I think our culture privileges, you know, shutting down and collapsing into television and what's known. And I think people get bored in their, quote, retirement years. Um, because if material moves automatically from the right to the left, we already, novelty starts to shrink. It's not like a child who's right. seeing the ocean for the first right. time and beyond it's awe. Harder. It's harder to, right? Yes. So it's harder to find those moments of awe and wonder unless we are seeking novelty mm -hmm. and also learning new things or challenging ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to jump out of a plane or mm -hmm. uh, but take a new course something yeah, yeah. so that um, I hope is instructive as people are listening to this also it's making me think well where have I started to shut down into the known mm -hmm. and where might I want to stretch you? myself do you well, feel like you have I think you know certainly there are certain things that are automatic mm -hmm. um, somebody today in my office here said that she jumped out of a plane this weekend because it was her mother's 59th birthday oh, wow. and her mom thought that would be a good thing to do did she jump out too? she jumped out too oh, and she cool. said she didn't she's afraid of heights but she loved doing it and I thought maybe I should do that this summer maybe yeah. I should go jump out of a plane absolutely because <laughs> uh, I've always wanted to absolutely and I, oh, oh, you, then you should. Yeah, and I said to her, you know, those experiences change us fundamentally oh, yeah. because what we thought we couldn't do, we do. It expands our possibility. Um, it lowers our fear. If there was ever a reason she had to do that in an emergency, um, she'd be much less scared. Well, and fear. It's interesting you bring that up because a lot of the, a lot of these um, the barrier to novelty for people is is mm. fear, and that's a good example. A right. lot of people are very well, that, afraid. Of, right. Well, she says she's afraid of heights, but fear of right. judgment, criticism is even worse. Sure. Or fear of uh, the product turning out bad, mm. or fear of something not working, fear of failure, sure. uh, fear of shame, fear at visibility. There's all sorts of things to be afraid of right. and as you're saying the more we the more we face those fears and move with the fear mm -hmm. as opposed to get rid of the fear we don't 
get rid of the fear. Right. Every time we, before we started this conversation, you and I were yeah. having a conversation, I was telling you I was terrified right. of my latest project, and mm -hmm. I get terrified of every single one that right. uh, comes through the door, essentially. And then I get to have this little mini drama. Right. Of, <laughs> I can't do it. Or what am I, I can't doing? Do it. Right. I tell myself I can't do it. I can't do it. Right. And then I do it. Right. And it, and I get ecstatic. Yeah. And and the ecstasy is completely internally generated. Mm -hmm. It's not you know somebody coming in saying oh that's great. Right. Right. Yeah. Because I've had that in my experience too with writing. Every time I'm staring at a blank screen, I'm thinking what did I get myself into? This is horrible. <laughs> um, and then I know that I just have to jump out of the plane, uh -huh. you know, metaphorically. Uh -huh. And then it starts to flow and it becomes right. sort of exciting and interesting, right. whatever starts to come out. And it gets easier. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, My first book took me 15 years to write. Right. They're always the longest. Yeah. And then faster and faster, mm -hmm. one year, then six months. And right. now I'm working on four at once. And yeah, that's right. That's really <laughs> something when you told me that. Um, and that means you've got lots of channels open in your creativity. In your yeah, mind. and for me, um, the range from doing a comic book for the general public mm -hmm. to doing this really technical science yeah. book with Cambridge scholars, right. that's the fractal epistemology for transpersonal psychology, mm -hmm. um, I love... The juxtaposition. Yeah, and I love the full range. Can you tell us what that means about the fractal book, the epistemology? Sure, yeah. The transpersonal this, psychology. I'm very excited about that It sounds that so one. rich and interesting. Well, I, I have been, as I know you know, I've been in love with fractals for a very long time. Right. Fractal geometry, which if people don't know what that is, mm -hmm. is, is the ge geometry of nature. And it's a holistic geometry where the shape of the whole is in the shape of the parts. And so, and it, it, it's a, a form of um, geometry that really um, unifies us with nature. So the way that rivers um, have branching patterns or trees have branching patterns mm -hmm. are very similar to how our circulatory oh, has right. branching, branching patterns, how our, each neuron <clears throat> has a branching pattern, how, um, how groups of neurons are connected in branching patterns uh, that are hierarchical, that are nested, and so there are these self-similar nestings all the way through um, through nature. So um, I was invited to, to um, I, 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 senior editor of the International Journal of Transpersonal Studies, saw a workshop that I did on clinical intuition in Vermont mm -hmm. um, and um, I was at Goddard College and I because I knew he was in the audience I made some claims about fractals that were transpersonal uh -huh. and he, he then invited me to write a, a paper for the journal on fractals and as I sat down to write I realized that I had this huge thing to say oh, wow. and it became a position paper uh -huh. that then uh, will now have 14 commentaries and is also being uh, going into a book mm -hmm. and um, uh, one of the one of the insights that I had is that uh, fractal boundaries are both open and closed at right. the same time, and they're observer dependent. Mm. So what we're doing is observer dependent, right. right? And the boundaries are shifting all the time. So the dynamic way that boundaries shift and they get open and closed as people move apart and move together uh, is modeled by fractals. But it's not just relationships that are modeled, it's also mind and brain, the, mm. the boundary Oh, right. Between mind and brain. And body, right? And body, yeah. right. Uh, mind and body, or inner and outer, mm -hmm. self and other. Um, so all of these things can be modeled in this using this form of math in a way that helps the field bridge some of its um, dilemmas because people want rigor in that. Some people right. want rigor and some people want pure subjectivity. Yeah, yeah. And this helps bridge that. Mm -hmm. um, and initially the, this, the editor that invited me was very skeptical about what I was doing. Right. And he called it a, um, uh, what was it? 
not a conflictual collaboration, but something like that. Uh-huh. So, like, it's paradoxical? Or? Well, no, where he was, you know, invited me to do it, but wasn't sure he bought what I was going to say. Oh, okay. And, um, I mean, this person is just sort of has a personality like that. Right. Personality is fractal, like, you know, <laughs> it can where... change. Well, not just that, but the, the how the pattern of the whole is in the pattern of the parts. Right. So somebody who's aggressive is going to, can be aggressive in multiple scales. Sure. In, you know, tiny scale of mm-hmm. conversation, uh, scale of cutting you off in a car. Right. Or um, seizing glory from colleagues, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So so that's, a, that's also a fractal dynamic. Um, but uh, so this this way that uh, open boundaries, openness um, is part of uh, the kind of intuition that isn't just the body based intuition, but is more um, the extraordinary kind of knowing, like oh, right. telepathy and this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so, so this this understanding of boundaries and fractal patterns, self similar patterns, um, can model synchronicity. I see. Can model the openness that's right. required. Can model uh, um, unconscious exchanges, which I think people have all the time. All and the they time. dismiss. They and dismiss. They don't want to yeah. talk about it. So I'm getting bolder. Oh, good. And start and talking in about talking it. about yeah. this stuff. And in fact. The um, third editor of this book um, himself has had this lifelong experience of um, walking under street lights and they go off and then he keeps walking they go back on again. <laughs> That's interesting. Or he'll break computers right. and then sometimes they fix again after uh-huh. that. Um, he had his life or his dream for a number of years has been to describe uh, the, the mechanism, the physics mechanism underneath mm-hmm. um, underneath that so we're probably going to do a project together after this what would he call that would he call that coincidence or is there an electromagnetic field between him and the street you know, lamps oh there well whether whether it's an actual field with right. a, with a transmission uh-huh. or whether it's a non-local event I see. that's going down quantum mm-hmm. into the quantum level is not clear but I can say it's one of the most studied paranormal oh, is it? areas. Yeah, there's a, a team in Princeton, mm-hmm. um, a lab in Princeton. Um, the the authors are John J A H N E and Dunn. Mm-hmm. Um, have been conducting experiments for twenty thirty years oh. uh, at a statistical level, mm-hmm. where they have just ordinary people try to uh, influence a random number generator, uh-huh. and it hap- You know, it happens, it happens. in small. I see. Statistically st- significant, but small ways. Now, right. some people are really good at it, uh-huh. and the people that are really good at it may that and um, that may have had near death experiences. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Why would that make them really good at it? Um, maybe something about if your life force is a, is either shut out and comes back on, uh-huh. or. About to shut off, you're close to that boundary. Maybe, yeah. Something like that. Part of me was wondering if it's because they really believed it. They really knew, sort of in their bones, which is a different kind of believing and knowing that they could influence that. No? It's not conscious. It's not conscious. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have to be conscious at right. all. Well, I know for coincidence, I no longer think of it as haphazard. I was in a car with friends on Saturday night, and um, we ran into a traffic snarl, and I had a thought, and my friend to the right verbalized it seconds after I had this thought. And it was a very clear, specific thought. (laughs) Um, And so I had that reaction, like, of course, we're all having that same experience Right. right now. And I think that happens, you know, in day-to-day, again, sort of ordinary experiences where you're thinking about someone you haven't seen in, in a long time and they call. They call. Right. Yes, this happens so often to people. And most people tend to dismiss it as coincidence. Right. And the more you dismiss it, the less that you tend to notice it, those right. things. And the more you have a theory like this fractal kind mm-hmm. of epistemology for Maybe why there are no coincidences at all. Right, yeah. 
um, maybe there's an underlying attractor. That's what I'm more inclined to think. Mm-hmm. And the That's other, what I believe too. Yeah, and the thing that happens around here is oftentimes um, people will, therapists here will be talking about their cases, somebody they're working with or struggling with or what have you. And as we have consultation or supervision, the person will come in and they're all set to bring forth all these interventions, etc. but the client's already bringing them in. So it's a form of remote viewing almost uh-huh. where we're embodying that person and the act of talking and thinking about them has them shifting right. before they even right. come into the therapy. Which is a form of non-local. That's yeah. non-local. Right. And that's the thing that we're, that uh, Jakob Shapiro is, is the man that I was telling you about who's a psychiatry professor right. in Canada. That's what he's very interested in modeling sure. with physics. And so, because um, people in our field mm-hmm. who talk about this, and people are talking about it more and more, right. um, I think we're getting bolder because we all experience, we all experience it. it. Yeah. yeah. And the more, the more heightened the arousal, mm-hmm. the better the chance that these kinds of things happen. Mm. Arousal in whom? Arousal, uh, well... Probably in both, okay, right? But um, certainly when our patients or our clients have high arousal, right. and we're more likely to have it if they have it, sure. um, then this kind of connectedness tends, right. tends to be higher. So than that feeling of urgency um, when feeling you say of high urgency, arousal. There's probably a survival, there's probably mm. an evolutionary pull. Right. Sure. For um, connectedness in danger. It, actually, there is one of my old Stanford professors, uh, Daryl Ben, when I was at Stanford, he was doing uh, androgyny with his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did a very controversial study about precognitive stuff that surrounds um, stimuli that have to do with danger and or, or sex, mm-hmm. because that's all survival yeah, based. Yeah, sure things and his experiment was so carefully uh, orchestrated right. you know the, the the methodology of it but it had to do with perceiving things that weren't even in existence yet Wow yeah so people had a lot of difficulty accepting this I'm sure and yet when you think um, you know animals, Often, often, I was thinking of animals. Yeah. I mean, they perceive danger and they, they communicate to each other non verbally all the time, right? And that pre you know, perceiving something before it exists that's what happens. I mean, by the time we get to verbal language, we're at a very gross understanding of something, right? right? Yeah, and so it's possible that there's a kind of informational base in the quantum world, mm-hmm. or, you know, just really deep in this non local. Um, soup that's one thing right that makes everything you know and and where the patterning uh, emerges out from, of that. from that the problem um, among some of our colleagues is that um, like a lot of psychoanalysts will talk about the inner subjective field mm-hmm. and as if it's actually tran- there's transmission of information across a field right um, but when it's non-local um, there's no transmission of information right I mean isn't that what people call prayer isn't that that's non-local? non-local absolutely and so if absolutely. I'm here and somebody's on the East Coast um, that is a there's no field I mean there's a 3,000 mile field right but it's, it's non-local it's non-local so right. so there needs to be a model that's uh, separate from a physical transmission mm-hmm. of a signal or information. Right. Yeah, because I suppose as we're sitting here in close proximity and then, we're making eye contact right. and we're feeling each other. Then information is going back and cool. forth. Right, and we can body, feel body, it. It's alive, it's excitatory. It's multiple levels, right. right? It's multiple levels. Our bodies are picking mm-hmm. up information right. about one another's bodies. Our brain stems. Our brain stems, our eyes. Our hearts, our, yeah. yeah our, we get entrained, mm-hmm. our that our movements are a bit entrained, yeah. and then there's the content of what we say at a cognitive level right. higher up the this cerebral yeah, we go the yeah. neocortex yeah 
Yeah, but when someone's across the country on the other side of the world, that's a very different um, way of knowing. Yeah, and there isn't a physical transmission, it appears, and so... Um, yeah, we're going to try to model that one next. Good. Well, that's yeah. exciting. Yeah. So it's really interesting and scary, sure. too. Well, sure. That would be scary yeah. because that really feels like a deep dive into the unknown. Both a deep dive into the unknown and a dive into areas that people don't even believe in. Right. Yeah. That it, that it exists. Well, it's interesting because we have such amazing powers as human beings, you know, for good or bad. Um, And we don't even know half of what we don't know about what we're capable of. Um, And the more I think we get wrapped in this culture of, you know, the culture of television, digital information, the more we can start to to sculpt our brains in ways that feel reductive Mm -hmm. um, and same. Like we all start to become the same as opposed to be creative and to kind of fly off into different directions to see Mm -hmm. what's there. Right. So you're saying really it takes courage to explore one's capacities and not limit it to what kind of talents you did or didn't get. Absolutely. So I hope this conversation inspires you to go out and play, to be creative in any way that's true for you, to have fun, and to investigate your own talent, to look for novelty, uh, and to find ways to express yourself uniquely as you.